Math 117, Class 12. First problem is rather long. It's five different scenarios to which we can apply the monotone convergence theorem. Let me remind you what that rather subtle theorem says. We have an increasing sequence x sub n of random variables. That means for any omega in the sample space, x sub n of omega is an increasing sequence of real numbers. And what the theorem says is that this sequence converges to a limiting random variable x that's integrable in the sense that it has a well-defined finite expectation. And this convergence is almost sure. That is, it happens except perhaps on an event with probability 0. And this is true if and only if the expectation of x sub n has a finite limit. This has to be an increasing sequence, but that means it either has a finite limit or it diverges to infinity. And in this case, the limit of the expectation of x sub n is equal to the expectation of the limiting random variable x. So let's try this out on five examples. First example, we're generating a random number in between 0 and 2. And on day n of this game, the payoff is 1 minus 1 over n for an irrational number. But for rational numbers, there's a big payoff of n on day n if it's rational. And you really hit the jackpot if omega is equal to 1. OK, this one's easy to analyze because the rational numbers have probability 0. Which means that x sub n converges to x, the random variable whose value is 1, almost surely. That's the left-hand side. And the expectation of x sub n. You can forget the rational numbers. It's just 1 minus 1 over n converges to the expectation of the limit x. So this is sort of the best case for the monotone convergence theorem. The random variables may diverge on a tiny subset of the sample space, but they converge almost surely. And in that case, the uh, sequence of expectations is bounded and converges to the expectation of the limit. Now let's look at case B. In case B, again, we have a payoff that goes up on a small subset of the sample space. But this time, the subset is we generated a random number between 0.999 and 1.1001. And this event has a probability of 0.001. So
while for most values of omega, x sub n converges to a limit of 1. On this subset with a non-zero probability, it diverges, and this convergence is not almost sure. In other words, the left-hand side doesn't hold, and the right-hand side doesn't hold either, because the expectation of x sub n is 0.999 times 1 minus 1 over n plus 0 0.001 times n, and this diverges to plus infinity. Okay, now let's look at case c. Case C is the really subtle one. Case C is the case where x sub n converges, but the random variable to which it converges is not integrable. So what's going on in case C? Well, except for omega equals 1, x sub n is bounded. Because in this case, what we do is we add in on each day an extra bonus from 1 minus 1 over k to 1 plus 1 over k. So for example, on day 2, we'll add a bonus that looks like that. On day 4, we might add an extra bonus that looks like that on day 6, an extra bonus that looks like that, <coughs> and so on. And for any value except 1, sooner or later, these bonuses stop being added in. So x sub n is bounded except for omega equals 1. That means it does converge almost surely. to a random variable x. But now we have to ask, is that random variable x integrable or not? And what we do best is to look at the right-hand side. Because the expectation of x sub n is the sum of all the bonuses up through day n. And we can fairly easily work out the expectation of the indicator function for the interval from 1 minus 1 over k to 1 plus 1 over k. That's the probability of generating a number in that interval. And that's an interval of width 2 over k. What fraction of the interval of length 2 is that? It's 1 over k. Which means that the expectation of the payoff on day n is equal to 1 plus a half from the bonus for day 2 plus a third from the bonus for day 3 on up through the bonus for day n. And this diverges as n approaches infinity. So if you look back at the theorem, x sub n converges almost surely, but it does not converge almost surely to an integrable x. And the expectation of x sub n is finite for all n. It's increasing, but its limit is plus infinity. It doesn't have a finite limit. Now let's look at two additional examples. The next one is a very minor variant of what we just considered. We add this $1 extra bonus, but now we're only adding it if the random number that's generated is within 1 over k squared of 1. 
So in this case, the expectation of the bonus for day n is the expectation of an interval that runs from 1 minus 1 over k squared to 1 plus 1 over k squared. And that expectation is the ratio of 2 over k squared to 2. It's 1 over k squared. And therefore, the expectation of the payoff on day n is 1 plus a fourth plus a ninth plus dot 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 plus 1 over n squared. And as n approaches infinity, this expectation approaches the sum of that series, which happens to be pi squared over 6. So in this case, the monotone convergence theorem does apply. In this case, x sub n converges almost surely, that is, except for omega equals 1, to an integrable random variable. And the expectation of that variable is the limit of the expectation of x to the nth. Now for the last one. In this case, the payoff is determined by a very simple formula. On day two, for example, the payoff is two if the random number generator picks a number between one half and three, four, three halves. On day four, we get a payoff of four if the number is between 3 fourths and 5 fourths, and so on. And you can see on every day, the expectation of the payoff is equal to 1. On day 2, you have a probability of 1 half of getting 2. On probability on day 4, you have a probability of 1 fourth of getting 4. On day n, you have a probability of 1 in n of getting n. So you say, ah, oh, great. This converges just fine. But x sub n is not increasing. We can't apply the monotone convergence theorem because this is not a monotone sequence of random variables. Why is it not? Well, consider some particular value of omega. For a while, the payoff keeps increasing for that omega. But sooner or later, That omega will fall outside the region that gets you any payoff at all. The value will drop to zero. And therefore, x sub n of omega is not an increasing sequence, and the theorem does not apply. For something different, completely different, let's move on to problem two, which deals with what I think is a rather curious aside in Deneen, showing that given any random variable that is non-negative and has an expectation of 1, you can cook up a new probability distribution. And I invented a rather fanciful example from the Napoleonic era. British Navy and the French Navy presumably hated one another in that era. And we can imagine that the British sailors on occasion would capture a French tricolor flag and show what they thought about the French by climbing up on a mast and spitting on the flag. Now, I need to invent a random variable with an expectation of 1 on the sample space. The sample space is the flag. And I can devise a random variable 
with random vari with value with expectation one by saying the payoff for hitting blue is three sevenths. That'll happen with probability one third. The payoff for hitting uh, white, sorry, the payoff for hitting red is six sevenths. And that happens with probability one third. And finally, the payoff for hitting right in the middle on the white area is 12 sevenths. That event happens with probability one third. And the sum of these three numbers is 3 21st plus 6 21st plus 12 21st, which is conveniently equal to 1. So now I can turn this into a new probability measure Q. What does this measure Q do? Well, a probability measure has to assign a probability to any event. Here is a representative event hitting the flag within the area A. And what it does is to assign to area of A 1 14th, that's 3 sevenths divided by the area 6 of the flag, times the area of the blue part of A. over here, plus 1 seventh times the area of the red part over there, plus 2 sevenths times the area of the white part. To check that this really is a probability measure, I compute Q for the entire sample space. That's area 2 of blue plus area 2 of red plus area 2 of white. And that's 1 seventh plus 2 sevenths plus 4 sevenths, which is equal to 1. Now you might ask, what is this good for? Well, we can now compute expectations with this new probability measure. And we need a new random variable whose expectation we're going to compute. This is, again, a function on the flag. It's the number of ounces of rum awarded to a sailor who successfully hits the flag. And uh, it's 2 for hitting on the left-hand side, 4 for hitting on the right-hand side, 6 for hitting the white area in the middle. And we can compute the expectation of y with respect to this new probability measure. How do we do that? Easy. We just take 2 times the probability of hitting blue plus 4 times the probability of hitting red plus 6 times the probability of hitting white. OK. The probability of hitting the blue part is equal to 2 fourteenths. So we get a payoff of 2 times a probability of 2 over 14 plus a payoff of 4 times a probability of 2 over 7 plus, finally, a payoff of 6 times a probability of 4 over 7 and for what it's worth. That all adds up to 34 sevenths. Now, it's also possible to do the same calculation 
by using the old probability measure P, but then we have to compute the integral of the entire sample space of the product xy of the two random variables with the old probability measure p. What do we get in that case? Well, xy if we hit blue is 3 sevenths for x times 2 ounces of rum for y and the old probability measure says that event has probability one-third. For the red side of the flag, x had the value six-sevenths, and y was four ounces of rum. That has a probability of one-third. And finally, for hitting in the middle on white, the payoff times the value of x is 12 sevenths times 6 for one third, and that also works out to 34 sevenths. You'll actually see this much more in the continuous case where people are very fond of finding functions that integrate to 1 and are negative or negative and say, and now we have a new type of random variable with a new named distribution. Okay, let's move on to number three. This is a very minor variation of one of the exercises in Deneen. X is an integrable positive random variable. That means it has a well-defined expectation. And in fact, that expectation is zero. And the challenge is to show that X equals zero almost surely. You might say, hey, look, if the expectation is zero and it can't be negative, it must be the function that's identically zero. But that's not so. It can fail to have the value zero on a set whose probability is zero. And we've got to prove this. And we're going to prove it using countable unions. So let's consider an event that I'll name a sub n. That consists of all the elements omega in the sample space for which the value of x is greater than or equal to 1 over n. Now let's think about the expectation of x, or in Deneen's preferred notation, the integral of x dp over the sample space. That's certainly greater than or equal to the integral of x dp for the event a sub n. And that, in turn, must be greater than or equal to the minimum value of x if the event a n occurs, which is 1 over n times the probability of a sub n. And this is true for all values of n. But we've been given that the expectation of x is equal to 0. And the only way that this can be 0, if it's greater than 1 over n times the probability of a sub n, we can conclude the probability of a sub n has to be 0 for all values of n. So, no matter what the integer n may be, the probability that we pick a place in the sample space where the random variable has a value greater than 1 over n has to be 0. Now, let's consider the countable union. This is a countable union, but for once, it's not a disjoint union.
This defines a new event, A. It's the union of all the events, A sub N. All the points where the value is either greater than one-half or greater than one-third or greater than one-fourth. And of course, if it's greater than one-half, it's also greater than one over N for any N greater than two. So this is all the places in the sample space where the random variable has a value that's greater than zero. Now, any such event has x of omega greater than or equal to 1 over n for some value of n. If you're bigger than 0, you're bigger than some fraction of the form 1 over n. Now remember Boole's inequality? Boole's inequality says even for non-disjoint events, the probability of an event A, which is a union of some A sub n's, is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. And since each of these events has a probability of zero, this sum is zero. Now we're given, or we're asked to show, that x equals zero almost surely. What does that mean? It means that the probability of the event where we have an omega for which x has the value zero is one, equivalently, the probability of the complement of that event is equal, or sorry, this is the complement of the event we've been calling A, and P sub A is equal to zero, and our result is proved. What we have proved is that if the expectation of non-negative random variable X is zero, then the set of events for which x has a non-zero value must have probability zero. And here's a standard example. Of a random variable that is not equal to zero, but nonetheless has an expectation of zero. So I'm going to choose a random number omega in between 0 and 1 and I'm going to define a random variable x of omega that is equal to 1 over q if omega is a rational number that when expressed as a fraction in lowest terms has a denominator q. But that has the value 0 if omega is irrational. So this is a random variable that is different from 0 for every rational number. It's definitely not the zero function, but it is zero almost surely because the probability of generating an irrational random number is zero, and furthermore, its expectation is zero. Well, this video has run awfully long, so I will put the proof into a separate video and terminate it here.